Cal Newport. Welcome back to the show. Brett, I'm always happy to chat with you. All right, so this is your fourth appearance on the A1 podcast. This is a rarefied group here. I don't. I think you might be the only one. Maybe I'm one other person that's been on the podcast four times. But we had you on the podcast first to talk about your book, So Good They Can't Ignore You. That's episode number 78. Then we had you on to talk about your book, Deep Work, and that's episode number 168. And then last time was Digital Minimalism. That's episode number 479. And you got a new book out called A World Without Email, Reimagining Work in an Age of Communication Overload. And what I like about your books is that each book seems to be building up upon each other. like You're seeing this thought process going on over years. How is this book, A World Without Email, a continuation of your previous work that you've written about? Well, with, with Deep Work in particular, I was talking about the value of focus. And it just seemed to me that we were underestimating how effective it was to just keep your attention on one thing at a time. We we're very distracted with email and Slack and, and our phones. And so I wrote this book that said, I think we should focus more. And, and here's my argument for why and here's how to train yourself to focus more. I naively assumed in that book that, okay, once that's clear, uh, we'll just spend less time on email. You know, okay, <laughs> once we realize, right? It's like, okay, great, maybe we should be less distracted. And the, the clear feedback I got was, Cal, you don't realize how entrenched this sort of constant distraction, this constant need to be checking inboxes, checking Slack on your phone all the time, that work has become this. And so I got interested in that question, you know, why? You know, why has work become this? And is there is it possible that we should be doing something else? And it, it blew up. It was like this huge topic that, that, that we had completely transformed knowledge work for no really good reason. It's making people miserable. It's holding back our national productivity. That's how much of an issue it is. And then there was this huge countervailing force that's probably going to completely change the way work happens in the near future. So I felt as if I had stumbled backwards into a massive story. And it took me four years to pull together all the threads, but I've been working on it since deep work. You've been writing about, you're thinking about this on your blog, and I've been following that. And it's been great to see how all of this coalesced in this book in a, in a really solid case. So you make this case that with the advent of email and digital communication technology, so like instant messenger, now we got Slack, things like Discord, uh, whatever. It's created something that you call the hyperactive hive mind. And this is across work cultures around the world. How would you describe the hyperactive hive mind? What is it? It's the dominant workflow. So it's the dominant process by which we collaborate and coordinate and knowledge work. And it's where we basically say we can figure things out on the fly with unscheduled, unstructured, back and forth digital messaging. So if we need to deal with this client request, we need to deal with this issue, we need to figure out who's going to work on this new proposal, we'll just send messages back and forth. Right, we just rock and roll in our inbox. Slack came along later as a way to implement the hyperactive hive mind even more smoothly, but it's doing the same thing. Let's just rock and roll back and forth on the fly, which, by the way, works fine if there's two of you. Yeah, there's two of us that wants to figure something out. Let's just go back and forth, figure it out. That's very natural. But if you scale this to a whole team and to a whole company with all your vendors and all your clients, it's entirely unsustainable. So when I say a world without email in the title of my book, what I actually mean is a world without the hyperactive hive mind workflow as the primary way that we collaborate. And as you said, like there, it seems like intuitively, oh, well, if you can do this things on the fly and, and send a te quick text message or a Slack or an email, you can get this done really fast. It beats you know, scheduling a meeting or getting on a phone call. But you, in the first chapters of this book, you make this case that, well, no, this promise of you know, uh, frictionless, seamless, that this of communication would make work better and easier and more productive. There's actually a lot of costs that have come with this hyperactive hive mind. And so one is you mentioned productivity. I mean, how has email and digital communication made us less productive when, when it first was introduced back in the eighties and nineties, you thought, Oh, this is the salvation. This is going to make us more productive. What happened? Network switching, right? So this is one of these huge under emphasized but critical realities of the way our brains operate is that network switching, and when I'm talking networks here, I mean neural networks, is expensive. So what happens in a typical hyperactive hive mind workflow is you have to keep tending these conversations. If there's two to three dozen different back and forth asynchronous conversations happening in your inbox, you can't be away from that inbox too long, right? Because the, the ball is pinging back and forth. You have to hit it back across the net. You have to keep checking, right? So you have to constantly be checking these inboxes. Every time you check this inbox, 
you initiate a context switch. Your brain is trying to switch its area of focus from the primary thing you were working on to all of these messages from people in your life, all these requests, some urgent, some not, some exciting, some upsetting. You try to switch over to this context and you glance at this inbox to see, you know, hey, did Brett answer me about when we're meeting? And then you wrench your attention back to the primary thing you were working on. That rapid network shift there creates a cognitive catastrophe. And we experience as a, a reduced ability to think, we get fatigue, we get anxiety, we get a sort of frustration and tiredness. We don't realize that when we check our inbox once every six minutes, we are setting ourselves up into a cognitive environment in which we are terrible at actually working with our brain. So yes, the hive mind was convenient on paper because it's much easier than figuring out more structured ways of working. It just has this nagging side effect of also making us terrible at doing our work. Gotcha. So yeah, what happened, we've talked about network switching on some, with some other guests, but it's like every time you switch attention, there's basically leftover, it's called attention residue, right? So you're still thinking about the previous task you're working on or the thing you were thinking about as you're beginning to think about this other one. And that results in you not being able to focus essentially. Yeah. And it makes you feel frustrated and it makes you feel tired and it makes you feel anxious. And we all have that. We all experience it, right? Like you, you check, you're checking your inbox while you're trying to write something else and you eventually just fall back into like, I'm just going to sit here and look at messages. Why? Because your brain can't do it. I mean, it's like you're trying to run a 440 faster than your legs are able to do it. We're, we're asking our brains to do things that they can't, but we have ignored this, this psychological reality of how our brains actually operate when we've designed our current workplace. And I think it's a crisis we just don't realize, a lot of people don't realize how much damage is actually being done. And we got to be like, people aren't just dealing with email or Slack. They're probably also checking Twitter. They're probably also checking Facebook or Instagram into the mix as well. And so that just makes it even worse. Yeah, that just amplifies it. But at least, at least you could decide as an individual, I'm not going to check social media while I work, right? The insidious nature of the hive mind, it's this might be how your organization actually gets things done, right? So you can't just say, and this is why, by the way, trying to fix these problems in the inbox always fail. To just tell people, you know, batch your emails, have better response time expectations, use inbox zero. The reason these fail is because the problem is not fixable in the inbox. You got to fix the underlying workflows that's generating all those messages in the first place. And so that's what makes this problem so insidious is that I can just say, I'm not going to check Twitter during work because it's trash to my concentration. It's much harder for me to say, I'm not going to answer my boss's email today during work because it's trash to my concentration. So we have a much uh, much stickier issue, which is why I think it has stuck around as long as it has. Have economists done studies on this, like where they've been able to put a a number on how much lost productivity we have because of email communication or digital communication? It's hard to get exact numbers, but there's uh, one hypothesis that I find compelling is that this shift to the hyperactive hive mind helped explain why over the last 10 to 15 years, where so much money was invested in making communication as low friction and fast and easy as possible, non-industrial productivity in this country has stagnated. And in fact, I would go so far as to guess that Non-industrial productivity would have probably fallen because this is taking such a toll on our brain, if not for the fact that we just added all of these off-the-book extra shifts that we do like early in the morning or late at night to actually get work done when we're free from all the communication about work. I think we had to add all these off-the-books hours just to keep the ship level. But if it wasn't for these extra hours we added, we probably would have seen non-industrial productivity strictly decreasing. So though it's hard to, to pull apart all the variables and say this is exactly what the effect is, I would guess that it is significant. And so you're making this case that you know one thing we can do, if we can restructure how we do work, we can unleash amount of, you know, like a bunch of lost productivity that we're not tapping into right now. Yeah, a, a huge amount potentially. I mean, one thing I cite in the book is Peter Drucker at the end of the 20th century said, the story of industrial manufacturing in the 20th century was a 50x increase in productivity from 1900 to 2000. There was a 50x increase because they got very serious about asking the question, what's the right way to build things? Not what's the most convenient way, not what's the easiest way, what's the best way to build things? And he said that 50x growth was so phenomenal that essentially all of the wealth on which the developed world was built in the 20th century came from that. He then looked back and said, okay, right now in 1999, when I'm writing this, where we are in knowledge work is where the industrial sector was in 1900. So he said, we had basically not even begun yet serious thinking about what's the best way 
to actually get a bunch of minds together and produce things that are valuable. So if there is a 50x increase in productivity possible here, it is an almost mind-boggling amount of economic growth and prosperity that is latent in this growing sector. And it's just sitting there because we haven't really started thinking seriously yet about, wait a second, what actually is the best way to get a bunch of brains together and have them collaborate to produce whatever, ad copy, computer code, uh, podcast, whatever it is. And so once we start doing that thinking, I think it's going to be phenomenal what we can unlock. All right, so the hive mind, it causes productivity because the task switching causes us to not be able to focus. But you also said besides the lost productivity, you mentioned this, that it's just making us miserable too. You've surveyed your readers and I know other organizations have surveyed workers about digital communication. Like that's the one thing they complain about. They just feel like they can never, never log off. Like what is it about email and you know Slack or whatever that causes us to feel like we need to respond and need to always be on even though we might not have to be. Well, so I have this whole chapter called, you know, email is making us miserable. And there's two threads of evidence that I uncover for uh, what I think is making us so miserable at email. Now, first is it just conflicts fundamentally with the way the social circuits in our brain operates. So our, if you look at the deep history of our species, we really take seriously our one-on-one relationships. Right? I mean, it is absolutely crucial to our survival, or at least it used to be absolutely crucial that you very carefully maintained relationships with different tribe members so that you could, for example, get food shared next time there's a famine or they don't put a spear in your back or whatever your concern was. These circuits get very upset when they think about messages from other people piling up. Now, you can tell yourself, oh, hey, look, I'm rational. I know that these messages are not urgent. I know that we have norms at our company that says, don't expect a response within 24 hours. None of this is going to directly affect my survival. You can tell yourself that in your rational mind, those deeper social networks don't care and they're anxious and they're upset. And you can actually measure this in the lab. There's these insidious experiments where they have people hooked up to heart rate monitors doing some sort of fake task on a computer. And they come over and say, look, your phone is causing interference. You're going to have to move it. And so they, they move their phone, but while they're moving it across the room, they, they turn off the do not disturb mode. And then they put the phone across the room, they go back to the experiment, and then they call it or send a text message to it while you're doing the experiment. Now, here's the thing. Rationally speaking, that person doing the experiment, they had put their phone in the do not disturb mode. So rationally, they've been like, I am not going to hear from anyone for 30 minutes. I'm fine with it. I'm doing this experiment. I'm completely fine with it. I'm completely happy with that. And yet, when they hear the phone ring from across the room, all of their stress indicators jump up because they had them all hooked up to these things for the fake experiment. Right. So no matter what your rational mind told you, it's like, it doesn't matter. A tribe member's tapping you on the shoulder. You're ignoring them. So this notion that there's always messages piling up and they're from people and they're from people who want you to respond. And right now you're not. That makes us really miserable. And then the other thread of things that makes us miserable is that we are not good at communicating linguistically. We lose a ton of information when we reduce communication down to just text that's sent in like an email or a chat. And we're we're, we're wildly misunderstood. People get upset. We misinterpret other people. We get upset with them. So it's just a really impoverished form of communication. So yeah, if we're sending like the occasional file to someone, no problem. But when we're doing most of our workplace collaboration, so our back and forth communication is happening by these text-based messages, we're constantly misunderstood. We're constantly misunderstanding other people. And that's incredibly frustrating. So you put these two things together. You know, yes, the hive mind is very convenient, it's very easy, and it's very cheap, but it also has this side effect of it makes us as human beings, despite our best efforts, just really miserable. Yeah, the miscommunication. Like I think everyone experienced that with email, but I know with Slack, like that's been amplified in some organizations. There's like Slack drama now in companies because someone writes something on Slack. And it, they were tr- joking, but it was completely misinterpreted or they didn't under- someone didn't understand. And there's like all this drama <laughs> that, that you know, HR has to get involved in. And that sucks away from productivity as well. So it's sort of this vicious cycle. Yeah, I mean, it's something we don't understand that if you, if you look at a real interaction between two people in the same room, the transcript of what they are saying is a fraction of the information that is actually being transferred in that room. And we wildly overestimate. I love these experiments I talked about in the book because they were funny. But the person about to send the email wildly overestimates how much they're going to be understood. Because, you know, in your head, you know what you're trying to say, and you hear all the context, and you hear all the nuance, and you're like, oh, this is great. Like, and, and on the other end, they're com- 
completely misunderstood. The analogy one researcher gave, and this was an actual experiment someone did, you know, if I'm going to tap on a table with my knuckle, be like, look, I'm going to tap out a song on the table. Because you hear that song in your head, you're like, this couldn't possibly be clear. Like, of course, this is happy birthday. And for the person across the room, they just hear like random knocks. <laughs> like, I have no right. idea what you're trying to send to me. That's a metaphor for what email communication is like. So how do we end up here? Like, why did we, why do we communicate the way we do with email and Slack, even though it has all these costs? Like, why, why, why do we have this such, why do we use this something if it's not effective? Well, I mean, this is one of the big ideas of the book is that no one decided this was a good idea. It's not that anyone sat down some CEO somewhere and said, here's how we're going to make more money if we could communicate more. There was never a Harvard Business Review article that said the future of productivity is we need more back and forth communication. It's actually relatively accidental and emergent. And I try to document this step by step. But basically, email spreads very wide through the early 1990s to the mid-1990s. It has this sort of exponential growth throughout the office sector. It spreads wide for an obvious reason, which is like, oh, it's a convenient way to send information in files. It's better than memos. It's better than voicemail. And it's better than fax machines, right? So, okay, so email spreads for because it's a useful tool. Everywhere where it spreads, we almost immediately get this hyperactive hive mind emerge. I actually have a case study in the book of a company, it's actually IBM in their headquarters, putting in internal email. And within three or four days, the amount of communication at that office had increased by a factor of five. I mean, this was like way too quick for anyone to actually say we're going to change the way we work. Just the presence of this tool seems to bring out the hive mind. And the reason seems to be is because it's very easy and convenient. Right? So in the moment, this is how humans will instinctually collaborate. Let me just grab you. I just need something. What about this? Like That's the way you and I would work together if we were in the savannah 100,000 years ago trying to build a fire. We would just go back and forth, ad hoc, unstructured. So it's very natural, very convenient. And so then the question is, why was there not pushback from management saying, yeah, this might be easy and convenient, but guys, it's making us really unproductive. The reason that didn't happen is that in knowledge work, we have a very strong culture of autonomy, that it is up to the individual worker to figure out how they want to organize their work. Management gives objectives. The knowledge worker on their own figures out how to organize themselves and organize their work. And in that, in that type of environment, What's easy and what's convenient and what's flexible, that's what's going to dominate. So we've been stuck with this hyperactive hive mind that no one ever really thought was a good idea because we don't really have an easy mechanism to dislodge it right now. No, so I thought that was an interesting argument you made. So first off, there's something about digital communication, the technology, and this is, goes into this idea of technological determinism. There's something about the technology that it, want, like it wants something. You know, we're saying this, it want, it's not, we're not saying that the technology is sentient, but like the way it's designed, it wants you to communicate more. It encourages that, basically. And that's what we're naturally going to do. And you noted that with the IBM thing. But the other issue too, so with this emergent thing happened, and then you had, you know, Peter Drucker, and we mentioned earlier, yeah, he made that case that in knowledge work, the knowledge worker has to learn to manage themselves. Like they had to be autonomous. And so, yeah, you, as you said, in business management, you hear this idea, give more autonomy to workers because it makes them feel happier because they feel like they're in control of their work and mastery and, and the like. And you talk about that and so good, they can't ignore you, right? But this autonomy, because everyone is autonomous and handling it on their own, it creates sort of a digital tragedy of the commons, right? So everyone's doing what's in their best interest, but by doing what's in their best interest, it makes things miserable for everybody else. Yes, because no one person can easily say, I'm not using the hive mind anymore. Because everyone else is going to say, well, wait a second, this is the only way we have to coordinate and collaborate with you. So now you are getting in the way of us getting our work done. Also, it's easier for me if you're doing the hive mind, because that means in the moment, I can get something for you. So this autonomy trap plays a big role. And, I, and here's my my take on it. I mean, this is one of these ideas that I haven't I hadn't heard before. So it's one of the things I've really been pushing. Uh, I also, there's a, a New Yorker article I wrote earlier this year called The Rise and Fall of Getting Things Done that really goes deep into this uh, autonomy trap issue as well. So it's something I've really been trying to understand publicly in recent months. And I think what happened is Drucker was correct that the actual work you do in knowledge work needs to be autonomous. You know, I can't tell an ad copywriter how to come up with a slogan. And I can't tell a computer programmer how to write an algorithm. Like I can't break that down into a Henry Ford assembly line. And he was right about that. 
But the workflows that surround that autonomous work, how we identify tasks, how we assign tasks, how we review tasks, and how we get the information people need to execute those tasks communicated, the workflows that surround this autonomous work, that we really need to think about at the team or organizational level. And that's where we fell into this trap is that we made all of that autonomous. And I think the way out of the trap is to say, yes, I'm not going to tell you as a computer programmer how to write computer code, but you better believe that we are going to have a really well-constructed project management methodology where we figure out what needs to be coded, who's working on what, we keep things off their plates, and we call that agile methodologies, and computer programmers do that. And it's actually been a great win for them. And so that's what we need to be doing in other parts of knowledge work. I'm not going to tell you how to do your work, but we better have really good processes in place for how that work actually is organized. And that's where the real wins are. Okay. So instead of spending all your time talking about the work through emails and Slack, you're actually spending time working on the work. Yeah. And the thing that kills us, the thing that makes the hyperactive hive mind so bad is the back and forth interaction. Email is fantastic for sending information or files. It is terrible for interaction. And so where we need to get to, and sort of the prescription in the book, is we have to get explicit. What are the different processes that we actually execute regularly in our team or in our business. All right, for each of these processes, how do we actually want to organize this process in such a way that it minimizes back and forth unscheduled communication? And you do that process by process, and you can eventually take that pressure off the inbox. That's the thing we have to get out of the inbox is talking back and forth about work. And it could mean a lot of different things depending on the process. It might be look, we just check in on this Wednesday morning at this time. It might be we have a series of steps in place. You know, you put the podcast episode in the shared drive by Thursday, close of business. The editor picks it up and gives you their notes by Friday morning, you know, whatever, right? You, you, you have some process where this is how we do this without requiring us to go back and forth. But by taking each of the processes that makes up what your, your team or your individual, your company actually does and saying, how can we actually implement these in such a way that minimizes us having conversations back and forth in email that defangs the hive mind. That's replacing the hive mind with more specific processes. And that's where I think all of the the wins will come looking in the near future. And you said like you you said you can look at what we did during the Industrial Revolution, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th century with Ford and his assembly line work. Like that's what he figured that out. Like the way they built cars before the assembly line, it was sort of ad hoc. Bring in some craftsmen, they'll do their thing, and then another group of craftsmen will work on and like cars took forever to make. But then Ford had this idea, well, no, we don't we won't bring the the workers to the car. We'll take the car to the workers and each worker will have their own little one job they do and then we can just start pumping out cars like nobody's business. And you say that like, we can actually use that model or thinking about our communication today in the same way and be more productive. Yeah, I think it's a very useful analogy because the way they built cars pre-Ford's assembly line, it was literally called the craft method. And it was the hyperactive hive mind of its day because it was convenient and it was natural and it was flexible and was easy to manage. Yeah, just we had to put the car, the chassis on sawhorses so you didn't have to bend over, but it was, okay, we're building a car here. And if we want to scale up our factory, we buy some more sawhorses and buy some more teams. It was easy, it was convenient, it was flexible. And the important thing in this analogy is Ford said, I think there's better ways to build cars, but those ways are going to be less convenient less easy, less flexible. They're going to require more management. We're going to have to invest more money and it's going to cause in the short term lots of bad things to happen because, hey, it's pretty hard to calibrate these assembly lines to get them to actually work. So it was a pain. But that pain made the Model Ts get produced 100x factor and changed Ford into one of the largest companies in the world. And I think that's a useful analogy. Not that there's anything specific about an assembly line that we would replicate in knowledge work. Industrial work is completely different than in knowledge work. No, we step up a level. This idea that what's convenient and flexible might not be the best way to do it. That sometimes going through the pain of coming up with better systems is worth it by far in the long run. And that's a mindset shift I'm pitching. And I think it is poetic that it took about 20 years from the beginning of industrial car manufacturing to Ford starting to innovate. How do we actually get past the easy ways of doing this? Well, if we... If we look at email, we're not too much farther than 20 years from the first sort of widespread adoption of email in the knowledge work sector. So we're kind of on track with that existing timeline for, okay, the tech is here. We've done the easy thing. Who is our knowledge work Henry Ford? Who's going to say, my company will take the pain of moving past the hive mind, even if it's annoying in the short term, because we'll be the biggest company in the world a couple of years later. And this is by putting in some structure and thinking about your work process. This 
will allow you to do what you call the attention capital principle, which is by thinking about your processes for the long term, you're actually going to allow your workers to be able to think on the thing that they're good at. So if it's an ad copywriter, they're going to be able to spend more time writing good ad copy instead of you know, doing back and forth admin work, trying to talk about the work they need to be doing. And that will actually just increase productivity. So like you're, you're taking a hit in the, maybe in the short term for long-term gains. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I introduced that that term attention capital theory to try to make this more concrete because I think we got a little bit confused because it's, well, it's people and it's fellow people and we're kind of just talking to other people and let's keep this convenient and we're thinking about interpersonal dynamics. Whereas in the industrial sector, we're like, oh, we have capital. You know, we have all this equipment and machinery and 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 you know, sheet metal and tires, and we want to figure out what's the best deployment of this to produce cars as fast as possible. And knowledge work is the same thing. So for now, it's what I call attention capital. It's the latent potential of all these human brains to add uh, valued information, to actually produce value in the knowledge sector. And we should be experimenting with what's the right configuration. How do we hook up all these brains in the way that's going to produce the best value? And when we think about it that way, yeah, we get all these innovations. Like, well, get rid of the hive mind. We should probably have a lot more specializations. Another thing that falls out, like people should be doing less. They should be focusing on what they do best. That's probably going to produce more value. Then allowing the HR department and the IT department and the CMO and all these people that just lay claim to time and attention, you know, when you start seeing this as we're trying to get a good return on capital, all these innovations fall out. And you're going to get a lot of different ways of configuring work, a lot of bespoke processes, a lot more specialization, a lot more protection of time and attention. We just have to have this first fundamental mindset shift that, yeah, it's human brains instead of factory equipment, but that doesn't mean we can't innovate and try radical things and really think outside the box about what's the right way to actually hook these brains together and have them produce stuff that's valuable. Well, let's talk about some things, some big picture principles of how people and organizations can structure work so they're more effective and get more done. And what's great about your book, you actually found companies who have been experimenting with this stuff. They've been experimenting, ditching the, the hyperactive hive mind. And so with all these organizations that have had success with this, what have been like the big principles you see them following to you know, get this attention capital, basically? Well, so, I mean, you, you certainly see a process-focused approach. So instead of just rock and roll in our inbox, let's actually name the different processes that we come back to again and again so that we can have conversations about how do we actually want to implement these processes so that we have less of this back and forth communication. You see a couple different responses to that question emerge. Like one thing that I I saw being very popular in these companies is that they would externalize and make transparent the work that's actually happening. So tasks and information get out of these inboxes and onto shared systems. You know, they're on a task board with different columns for different statuses and information and notes from the clients and files are attached to these virtual cards and who's working on what is crystal clear. And they have some synchronous way. We get together every morning for 10 minutes. We look at this, who needs what from whom, okay, go work. So you see that common. Communication protocols come up a lot. So if there's something that just involves, I got to check this, I have to send it back to you. You have to approve my changes that it needs to go to the producer or something like this. Any of these sort of replicatable processes You'll see a lot of protocols emerge where they say, let's just figure out how we do this. It does not require me to just shoot you a message. And so you get these protocols in place of like, this goes here by this time. I change this status in a spreadsheet. That's how you know to grab it. Your notes go here. I approve it. Where where suddenly you automate these processes so they don't require messaging. That's also quite common. And then you see what I think of as just innovations around communication density. So you might have things like office hours. Twice a week, you know, I'm in this Zoom room or I'm in my office if, if you're in person and a lot of quick coordination and questions just gets moved to, yeah, just grab me in my office hours, right? So you get these sort of general innovations or, or you see email addresses get disassociated with individuals. Well, no, we have an email address for this client. That client uses that email address to communicate with us. That, that email then goes into a system that's monitored by a lot of people and we have shifts, right? So you get these kind of, think of these as these ad hoc communication Innovation. So these are the three classes of things you begin to see. Once you start from the fundamental premise of the hive mind's not the only way to work, we have these underlying processes. What could be better? So, so yeah, and I think what it sounds like is this is kind of counterintuitive, but when you start thinking about these processes and putting these protocols in place, you're actually making communication 
more complicated because there might be multiple steps and multiple, multiple systems you have to set in place. But by increasing complication, you actually in, decrease complexity, right? Because like whenever you allow ad hoc or sort of asynchronous communication, anyone can talk, like you have all sorts of different people communicating, like that's, com- that's complex, all these different interactions going on. But if you just inject a bit of friction, a bit of complication, you reduce that complexity and things actually more streamlined. Yeah, we, we place too much emphasis in this current moment in this particular sector on convenience. Convenience is not a very useful principle for designing an effective business. I mean, no one looks at a, you know, Musk, Elon Musk Tesla assembly line and says, this is really a pain. Like, we have to invent these robots and program all these robots and have all these, like, just-in-time production systems. Like, this isn't easy. You know, it would be much easier if I could kind of just build a car with my friends or something like this, right? And they would say, who cares if it's easy? You know, convenience is not a relevant principle. And so, that's a mindset shift that has to happen, is that our goal is not to avoid small bad things from happening. Our goal is not to try to make things as convenient as possible. And certainly, our goal is not, as it seems to have been in the tech sector in the last 20 years, to reduce as much friction as possible from communication. Because our job is not, we don't get paid, right? We don't get paid by the, the inbox size. We get paid by producing valuable things. So it's the wrong, these are all the wrong metrics to look at. So yeah, it does seem counterintuitive at first, some of these processes you use to replace the hive mind. Because you say, there's more upfront cost. There might be more time involved I have to spend in the moment. But once you step back and say, my convenience, even time, friction, none of these things are directly what we're trying to optimize. And what we're trying to optimize is producing effective results in a way that is sustainable for the workers, that doesn't burn them out or make them miserable. And those solutions tend not to be convenient. They tend not to be low friction. They tend not to be flexible. And we just have to get used to the fact that it's okay. But that's how most business runs in most other sectors. So the outliers here are really the office worker that says, I know, but it would be inconvenient if Bob didn't answer my email right away. You know, so we're kind of the outliers. We need to get our act together. So you mentioned some things that pe- some of these companies have done. And one thing, you make this really strong case for a type of work. And you mentioned it earlier, this sort of agile development or scrum or Kanban. 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 Yeah, for those who aren't familiar, this is something that computer programmers have used. And this is your... This is what you do. You you are a professor of computer science, so you're, you're familiar with this stuff. For those who aren't as, who aren't familiar with agile development and task board, like what does that look like? So one of the key things in agile methodologies is everything that's being worked on or needs to be worked on is stored in a common, transparent, centralized place. So traditionally, this would be post-it notes on a whiteboard, but obviously, this you can do this virtually very easily, right? So you have this board. I call them task boards. Every methodology has their own name, and you have these cards on the boards that represent things that have to happen. You have columns that represent statuses, like waiting to work on, in progress, you know, Q&A, testing needs to be done, done, etc. And everyone sees everything that needs to be done, everything being done, what's everything's status. They also then add in, they're called status meetings, and traditionally they're held standing up, they're every morning, and they're fast. And during these status meetings, you say, this is what I worked on. This is what I was working on yesterday and how it went. Right, So there's accountability. Here's what I'm working on today. And here's what I need from people to get that done. And then you're basically left to execute. And one of the big concepts, especially in Kanban, is something called the works in progress limit, where they're explicit about how many things should we do we want one person to be responsible for at a time. And because this is inspired by industrial manufacturing, they realize that if you significantly cut that down to just one or two things at a time, that's much more effective than putting 10 things on someone's plate and having them just try to figure that out over time. But my big point about these methodologies, which I talk about a lot, is not that in other types of work you should be using Scrum or you should be using Kanban. It's actually a higher level observation, which is what they did right is they said, we're not just going to hive mind it. We're not just going to rock and roll an email and say, uh, knowledge workers are autonomous. Let's just figure out, we'll just kind of figure things out over Slack how to program this code. They put in place these really set workflows that allowed people to get more out of these brains and people to be less burnt out. That's the lesson I want to pull away for other types of work. Not that you should use Scrum, but you should have whatever your own equivalent of Scrum is in place. Don't just settle on, let's rock and roll. And I mean, one of the big takeaways too is how effective in-person meetings can be. Like they don't have, like I, I think most people, they think, oh, meetings, like that's the bane of any office worker's existence. 
But the way you describe how these companies use meetings, they're like, there's a single purpose. It's to do the check-in. And after that, it's done. You're not doing any, there's no, you're not reporting like, here's what we're going to do. And then how's everyone doing? And blah. it's just like, here's what I've done. Here's what I need. And then here's what I'm going to do. And it takes 15 minutes and you're able to, and then you follow that up a, a week later and you do ask the same questions. Here's what I did. Here's what I, I needs to be done. And here's what I'm going to do. And things just start flowing once you add that little in-person meeting instead of having to go back and forth in email saying, well, I need this file. Can you send me this? But it, you, don't, you don't do that anymore. And I, so I've seen, and I document in the book, other type of work where they pulled in that same highly structured status meeting approach in all sorts of other type of work. And it's been really successful. So I talk about, for example, a UX development firm. They're not coding. They're like designing user interfaces. So it's a different type of thing. But they have their morning status meeting, and then they have another one in the afternoon. Like the morning status meeting is how they figure out what to do during the morning, and they just work. There's no Slack. Email's barely used. Then they check in at two, and then they work until the end of the day. And and then they have systems. So they were using Basecamp, a project management system in this particular example, to keep track of all the information about each client. So everything is stored. You see what's going on. And they don't use email for anything except for delivering files and private communication. So like if I'm going to talk to you about your salary, I don't want to post that on, you know, Basecamp where everyone else can see. And so that's really effective. And it's because synchronous communication is very effective. Real-time back and forth is incredibly rich and incredibly effective. The reason why we hate meetings is because there's other things people use meetings for, which is pretty terrible. And when people start to use meetings, for example, as a proxy for productivity, like here's something I need to work on. I'm kind of disorganized. I don't trust myself to actually make progress on this. So let's just get a meeting on the calendar. Because the one thing I know I will do is if I see a meeting on my calendar, I'll attend it. And now I don't have to worry about this. So we we start to use meetings as a way to work around the fact that we're unorganized and unable to actually schedule and execute work without being forced to do it. And then what you end up with is you end up with days full of meetings where it's like, I I guess we're talking about this project. And those are killer. But synchronous communication if you can structure it and there's a purpose for it, is way better than trying to take that same conversation and say, well, we'll just work it out on emails. We'll just work it out back and forth because you don't realize that five minutes check-in on the status meeting, that turns into a dozen back and forth emails otherwise. And a dozen back and forth emails might turn into 120 email inbox checks as you're waiting for each of those messages to come in and to respond. So we should not underestimate the cost of taking synchronous coordination and saying, well, we'll just figure it out on the fly. And also, the other nice thing about organizing your work by, with these boards, right, is that you can create multiple boards for different projects. And then that reduces task switching. So you can like look at one board for this one project, and then you say, well, I'm moving on to this next board because I'm done with that board, this that project. Instead of going to your inbox where you see just sort of, it's basically whoever, it's chronological, like reverse chronological. So instead of just going through down your email list and saying, oh, I got to do this, and that's one project, and I got to go to this next email, and that's a different project, you're with the board, organizing by project with these boards, you're able to reduce task switching. Yeah, which is one of the examples I gave was Davish's marketing firm. And you know he was so happy after they made this shift, and it was just like you were talking about. It's, they used Trello as their particular software. One board per client. And then everything about that client's on this board. Like, okay, here's the notes from the last call we had. Here's from the brainstorming meeting. Here's the file with the proposal. Everything's on here. And the way he explained it to me is my day is now, let's load up a board for the project I want to put my attention on. And then you're just in that world. Like all you were seeing is information for that client. You're looking at the updates since you were last there. You get up to speed with what's going on. You take the thing that you could be most useful on. You work on it for a while. You update the card and attach your results so that you've you know you've updated the status of the project. You know an hour has passed, and then you say, okay, now I'm done. I'm going to work on another client, and then you shift your context. And he really emphasized, right? The founder of this company, Davish, really emphasized. He's like, it just the positive impact of just being able to do one thing at a time. He didn't realize how much of a relief that was going to be because otherwise, you're exactly right. It's like, well, I'm kind of working on this project, but it's an email. And so I'm going to see about seven other projects at the same time. And I'm going to kind of try to answer some of those messages and switch back to this message. And then you're just exhausted and miserable. And then you start doing the inbox surf. You're like, well, I just want to find the messages that are easier to respond to. Everyone knows that effect. That's because you burnt out your brain from the context switching, where you start inbox surfing to find the stuff to answer that's easy. So you're like, at least I'm busy. And they don't have any of that anymore. They like work on a client for a while and then they're done. And then they work on another client for a while and then they're done. 
And it seems like a little thing, but it made all the difference in terms of how people at that firm felt. And I even wrote about, like, he showed me his boards. And I wrote in the book about how it must have been what it felt like if you worked for Buick and the first time you walked in and saw the Henry Ford assembly line. You're like, oh, yes, this is obviously a much better way to do it. (laughs) That same sort of aha moment for me. I was like, this is obviously better than an inbox. You know, you just had to see it for a second to realize that. And this ties in with another thing you've written about with time blocking. So you could have a board, like a, a board for one project. You can actually plan out your week and say, on Mondays from 10 a.m. to 12 a.m., I'm working on X project. And all you're going to do is look at that board. And then you can say, well, on Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., I'm going to work on this other project. And you can actually schedule that out and you know exactly what you're going to do. You don't have to think about it because it's already on the calendar. Yeah. And you, and you know it's coming and you can do that across the whole team. And and I you know I talked about another company that did this. They were using Flow. All these tools kind of do the same thing, right? It's cards on boards that you can attach stuff to and assign them. And they're all great. I don't have any particular favorites. They did like you were talking about, and and they anchored these sessions with these short status meetings. So it was you knew like yeah for this project we all get together for fifteen minutes at this time, and then we can all just go and work on that, right? So we can we can quickly sync up. Like, okay, wait, I need this. You need that. We send that in here. What are we doing? We got it. Good. And then they're just in that world and that's what they work on. And so these these synchronous status meetings anchored sessions in which everyone was going to be working on that project. And so, but once you start thinking about attention capital theory and getting away from the hive mind, all of these things become options. Like all these innovation floodgates just open once you realize, what if we don't just rock and roll in an inbox? And another case you make in this book, and it's going to be, I don't know, I wouldn't say controversial, but it's it's counterintuitive the way we do work today. One of the other things that happened with digital communication is it allowed people, workers, to be become generalist, right? You could, instead of relying on a secretary to handle your scheduling, well, you can do that through calendaring tools and email. You don't need a secretary anymore. Instead of relying on some other uh, support staff to do I don't know, marketing. Well, no, as a CEO, like you can easily do marketing yourself if you're a small business owner with these tools. But as you make this case, because we've become generalist, we've actually diluted what we're able to do that actually brings in money or productivity. Yeah, we're doing way too much. I mean, the, what, what's typically on the plate of a normal knowledge worker is too much. If you want to, again, maximize the return you get on the investment in this human brain, one of my favorite studies that I cite in the book, but I talk about all the time because I just love it, is this economist from Georgia Tech. And this was in the early 1990s, late 1980s, early 1990s. So he was looking at the very this first wave where personal computers came into the office, and it was doing just like you're talking about. We don't need typing pools, and we don't need a travel agency internal. You can just book that on the intranet. Like you know, This is where we got rid of a lot of support staff. And he took 20 different departments over five major companies, and he... he studied like what they did. And okay, so they fired a lot of support staff, right? Because I don't need a typist. I can I can do a word processor. So I don't need a typist. And you know, I don't need a receptionist because you can do email, etc. What he did, which was cool, is he crunched all the numbers. And he said, okay, here's what happened. Yeah, that work got easier, but it moved onto the plate of the executives that were doing the actual frontline value creation for the firm. So in order to get the same amount of work done, they had to hire more of these executives because they were now spending a huge portion of their time servicing administrative tasks. Well, the salary of these executives is more than the salary of the support staff. Sasson crunches all the numbers and says, in the end, on average, their salary costs ended up 15% higher. Because it was like you fired the assistants and then you had to hire more of the executives to, to, to get the same amount of work done and, and you ended up spending more. And he called this the diminishment of intellectual specialization. That's the effect. And and basically his warning, which I think is a good one, is that making tasks easier in isolation don't necessarily make companies more effective, broadly speaking. And we saw this with email. You make it easier for people to communicate. You make it easier for people to grab someone's attention. Doesn't mean they become more effective. You can actually make them less effective we end up sending more work to each other. We end up assigning more tasks. We end up claiming, trying to lay claim to people's time and attention more often. We tend to do this in less efficient ways, in ways that distracts people more. So I think email is just a, a continuation of this trend 
of making certain things easier with technology in the workplace doesn't necessarily make that workplace more effective. All right, so counter to the notion, if you were a business owner, you might actually want to hire more people. Again, this is making work more complicated, but uh, it, there's going to be friction, but you actually might save more money because you... Yeah because, yeah, because what I think, here's what should have happened, right? So I think the the way that we should have leveraged IT technologies that made certain support tasks more easier. The wrong thing to do was to say, let's fire the support staff and put all this work onto the plate of the people they were supporting. Instead, the right way to take advantage of that is to say, oh, with smaller support staffs, we can implement the same amount of support work. That was the right way to maximize the advantage of productivity saving is that we're not going to put anything new onto the plate of the frontline value producers. Where we're going to save money is that now that we have all these tools, the support staff can use all these tools. And now we don't need as many support staff to support the same amount of people, or the support staff can give even more support to the computer programmers or the ad copywriters. That would have been logically actually the way to maximize value by completely eliminating the support staff and moving that work onto the plate of the frontline workers. It was just a mistake. It wasn't the optimal return we could get on that particular technological innovation. All right, so just to recap here, we've been talking about these principles sort of high level, and you get into details with it. And there's lots of books out there if people want to like pick up a book about Scrum or Sprint or whatever. But the idea is instead of relying on email, you want to create systems where you don't even have to communicate with each other through email. Like you can just look at the, like a, it could be a task board online or it could be a whiteboard with post notes, and all the information about the project is right there. And it like it's it's self evident basically what needs to be done, and then you might incorporate some check in meetings that are once a week or every day that are just fifteen minutes, and by thinking about that and structuring it, you can spend less time talking about work and actually working. So that's that the idea. Yep, I think that I think that's absolutely right. Email is great for sending broadcasting information or delivering files, but for all the interaction that needs to happen about your work, find ways to do it. It doesn't require that ad hoc messaging. Okay, so let's talk about this. Uh, if you're a business owner, easy to do, right? Because you're like, okay, I, I heard this. I'm going to implement this. Let's say you work at a company. You're just sort of a, a staff member or an employee, or you know, in your case, like you work at a university, which I know are just. I have friends who are professors, and it's the hyperactive hive mind is full blown there. How can you? implement some of this stuff we've been talking about so you know from the bottom up is it possible what do you think yeah here's the good news if as an individual that has no leverage over how anyone else works if you still go through this mindset shift and say my work is made up of processes there's these repeated processes that I'm a part of again and again that produces value there's the answer the client questions process there's the you know whatever get proposals together process go through and figure out what these processes are And the best way to do this, by the way, is actually when you're in your inbox, just ask this question about every message you answer. What process is this email interaction connected to? What process is this email interaction connected to? And that's a good way to quickly uncover, oh, here's the things I do regularly. And then for each of these, go one by one and say, given just what I can control, how can I minimize the amount of back and forth communication required to execute this process? What I found is that even if no one else is on board with this, that type of thinking can have a huge effect, right? So sometimes it's just stuff you're doing internally. Like, okay, the the way I keep track of information and gather information from people prevents there being a lot of back and forth. You know, we have to schedule a meeting and I just send a schedule once link so we don't have to do back and forth. And sometimes you can stealthily recruit people into your processes without calling it that, right? So you say, all right, we got to get this, uh, we got to get this this, uh, proposal out there. So here's, here's, here's what I suggest. I'll have a draft uploaded to Dropbox by noon on Monday. You take a look, put any comments you have into it. I'm planning to work on it Tuesday afternoon. Let's have a, I have this office hours Tuesday at four. So if there's any questions, just grab me then and we can we can chat about it. And then I will send it off to the developer Wednesday morning. Right? They don't know this is a process, but what you've done is you've just brought them into a plan that doesn't require back and forth communication. And they're just busy and overwhelmed. They're like, great, I'm glad you know Brett has a plan. I don't have to worry about this. They've just been drawn into a process that's going to minimize back and forth. So if you just asymmetrically optimize processes to reduce back and forth, you can have a massive increase, a massive improvement, I should say, on how hyperactive the hive mind is and how much pressure you feel to have to keep checking these inboxes. And I imagine another thing you can do is just talk to your boss and be like, hey, I got this idea that would make us more productive and make people less miserable. 
and they, they might listen to that. Yeah, and just have a safety valve. What works there is A, positivity. Oh, I think, I think we can get more done, right? And B, put in a safety valve. This is what gets rid of the main complaint of like, what if something bad happens? You say, and of course we have a safety valve where you can just call me if there's an issue or it's not working. These safety valves are never invoked. No one ever calls you. <laughs> the processes work, but it gets past the main mental block that bosses have, which is like, what if something happens unexpected this process can't handle? I'm worried about not being able to reach you. I'm worried about a client thing being missed. You just put in a safety valve of like, I always have my phone. It's always on. Just call me if there's any issues and, and we can take care of it. And don't worry, the valve's never open in practice. Yeah, no one ever calls, but they'll send an email if, yeah. you, if, you, uh, if you allow 10, that, right? Yeah, 10% more friction. It's crazy. There's the, this researcher was telling me this story, by the way, of they went into this company and, and they took a dozen people in this big company and said they're not going to use email for a week just so they could see what happens, right? <laughs> it's this mindset of like, let's study how this dynamic works by breaking it and seeing what goes wrong. And this one guy was telling her about how, you know, he hated that every week he had this big period where he had to set up a lab. It was a research company. And his boss would just be like, email, 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 do this, do this. What about this? What about this? You have to answer me. And during that seven days where this guy was not on email, the boss completely stopped bothering him with these things. And what made it so interesting is that the boss's office was two doors down. So just the friction of the boss having to walk two doors down the hallway and say, you know, hey, Fred, can you grab this for me or do this thing for me? Just that little bit of friction drastically reduced the amount of time he was bothering this. So yeah, a little bit of friction goes a long way. Zero friction is very, very dangerous. A little bit of friction, I have to walk down the hallway and I have to like look at your face and bother you, is a completely different ball game than I can just hit send and it costs me nothing. So we should be very afraid of zero friction in all sorts of physical systems. Things go crazy when you get rid of the friction. No, I've, I've experienced that. And it's funny, once you... Whenever I've like had problems with my website, for example, I got a web developer, and my as soon as there's a problem, I'm like okay, I'll just this, shoot this guy an email, and then you know he might not take he might take a day to get back to me, but but in that time I'm I'm working on it. And I oh never mind, I figured it out myself. I'm sure that happens to IT people all the time. It's like the bane of their existence. It's like oh yeah, turn off and on my computer and that'll solve it. And I, I imagine if there was if I had if that my developer had some friction in place and like, okay, you only call me if you have a serious problem. I probably wouldn't send any emails to him with these stupid problems I figure out on my own. Yeah, I think that's right. Friction is, we don't understand uh, fully <laughs> what goes wrong, what goes wrong when you push this friction down to zero. Yeah, or like, yeah, hey, we have a call. You know, I did, by the way, I ran a web development company when I was a teenager in the 90s and I was a high school student. And this was before cell phones and this was before laptops. So like I was literally unavailable and we just built out this system. And wh the way we did it is we had these set calls, you know, and like, yeah, we'll, we'll go through all your issues and we'll document everything we told you and put it and we'll upload it to this extra net. You can see exactly what we're doing and we'll have a work blog and our team will, you know, we just had to put in place more difficult systems and we were able to run a company with essentially zero email. So like, there's a lot of other ways to do this that have a little bit more friction it keeps everyone happy and the work gets done. Because you know, one of the big points I make is that we, we think accessibility is what everyone wants, but really what they want is reliability. Like they want to know they can trust that you're going to get the work done, that, that you know what you're doing, that things are happening. If they don't trust that stuff's going to happen, then they're going to want to be able to access you all the time. Because they're like, this is going to be on my head until you confirm you saw this. But if you have a system in place they trust, people are pretty happy not to have to bother you all the time. People don't like doing that. But they also don't like having to keep track of things in their own head and not trusting you. So, you know, reliability often trumps accessibility in these situations. You got to remind yourself, we, we fought World War II and won World War II without Slack or email. And you actually talk, you talk about George Marshall, like this guy was the guy in charge of the war. And the guy hardly, like he wasn't really doing a lot of communication back and forth. He just worked and then he was done for the day and then he went off and rode his horse and then he came back in the office and that was it. He didn't really, he wasn't on all the time. Yeah. He stopped at five because that's the way they dealt with heart problems back then. <laughs> it's like, I will die if I work past five. He didn't work past five. But he's a great example because managers often tell me, look, in my job, I have to be very responsive. That's what my job is. But I say George Marshall was the manager to defeat all managers, right? I mean, this guy was in charge of the entire U.S. Armed Forces during World War II. And what he did is, instead of trying to say, how do I most effectively deal with the communication structures and systems in place, which is the way that I think a lot of managers think about it. Like it's, it's unavoidable, all this communication is going to happen. So I just have to be really fast. He just changed the structure from scratch. 
He fired a lot of people. He consolidated a lot of things. He put people under him. And he drastically reduced the number of people who had direct access to him. And he put in place more processes. Here's how meetings worked. They're going to be incredibly effective. He was very sequential. One thing at a time. You come in. You, you've done your research. Here's the issue. Here's, why we think, here's, the, here's what we think the right answer is. Marshall gave his feedback. Okay, here's my addition to that. Great. Next. And he would just do that one thing after another. You couldn't grab them. It wasn't hyperactive hive mind. Be done by five. So I, I use this example for managers. Like, don't think that the way that your communication and collaboration systems and, and habits in place now are unchangeable. And all you can do is figure out how to deal with those most effectively. You can proverbially fire your own, you know, kernels like Marshall did, by which I mean you can rebuild how you organize and collaborate and communicate with your team in such a way that isn't just completely hyperactive in mind. If he could do that and he had higher stakes, more pressing things, a bigger budget, more people, all the stuff you think is hard in your job, he had it 10 times harder and he was done by five. That's inspiring. And, and also, I mean, you can also do this in your personal life too. You highlight how you've done this, implemented some of these ideas in your own personal life. So you can have a board for you know the vacation and then you have a board for I don't know, some household project you got to do. And you can do like a status check-in with yourself or your spouse or even like a family where everyone's on the same board. And that's something we kind of implemented in my own family. Like my wife and I, we get together once a week. We have a family, like a marriage meeting. And then we say, here's what we need to get done. Are you doing that? And then it takes 15 minutes and we're good for the rest of the week. And yeah. then we do have a family meeting. Same thing. Kids, what's going on? What do you got going on? Would you need to bring anything to school? Okay, that's it. And it takes 15 minutes and you're done. Yeah. You guys aren't on a, a Slack channel. Just bother. Like, no. hey, hey, like Brett, we need the uh, the milk or whatever. Can you grab that? What happened to that? Can you do this? Like, think about that. You could take that 15 minutes and a clear place to store who's doing what and all the information. You could replace that with just like a ton of ad hoc conversations throughout the week, but it would be terrible. And, and that's right. how we do a lot of other work right now. Well, Cal, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? So uh, my website, calnewport.com, that's where my blog and newsletter are. You can find out about the book. Also my podcast, Deep Questions. We go deep on all these issues. I, I answer reader questions from people you know, in business with specific case studies. How do I deal with this issue? So if you want to go deeper on it, that podcast also has some answers as well. Fantastic. Well, Cal Newport, always a pleasure. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Brett. My guest today was Cal Newport. He's the author of the book, A World Without Email. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at his website, calnewport.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash noemail. We find links to resources where we can delve deeper into this topic. 